Welcome to this evening's discussion on women and work who pays. And thanks for coming on a in, in a week where I could understand if many of you were sick of talking about politics. We, of course, when we set the date and the topic, we had no idea what an interesting political week we, we would be speaking in, which is both a plus, but I can understand a certain amount of fatigue as well. Um, I'm, my name is Sophie Cunningham, and I'm joined tonight by Dr Claire Wright, Clementine Ford and Michelle O'Neill, who are sitting from right to left. <laughs> um, but before we, we get underway, I'd like to um, introduce the Melbourne City Councillor, um, Dr Cathy Oak, who, who's going to speak to us briefly. She's a scientist and environmental consultant, which that means I think she has quite a few things she could say about what's happening at the moment, even though I'm not sure that tonight's the night. Um, she's a chair of the Future Melbourne Committee and the deputy chair of the Future Melbourne Environment Committee. Um, please make Cathy welcome. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, I've only got two minutes, but I'm sure I could speak for five hours on tonight's topic. Um, thank you for coming along, and, and thank you to our guests for, for being here tonight. I think it will be a, a very interesting topic, and as a new mother returning to work myself just last week, it is a topic I really wanted to make sure I was here to listen to. But before we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting here tonight on the land of the traditional owners, um, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Um, as Sophie's already introduced our guests, and I'm sure you'll hear more about them later, but thank you once again for taking part in tonight's Melbourne conversation. And, um, and as already been noted, it is an interesting week, um, and I will leave it to the panel members to make a comment on what, you know, what message it sends to our community to have one woman in, in Cabinet. Not that local government is perfect. Um, across Australia, less than 30% of councillors are women. 20% um, of women are employed in senior executive roles in the local government sector. Um, the City of Melbourne has slightly better um, averages on, on these, such as, you know, we have 33% of, of women in senior, senior executive roles, and we have a, a CEO, a, a woman CEO, Cathy Alexander, who is one of the 7% of um, women CEOs in local government across Australia. I mean, in terms of elected reps, I'm one of four out of 11 elected reps. Um, I don't um, miss an opportunity to encourage any women in the audience tonight, whether you'd like to run for politics um, or know of another talented woman, to tap them on the shoulder and, and encourage them to run for politics, because if there's one thing we can do is definitely encourage the, the talented women that we know around us to, to put their hands up and, and increase these numbers, um, whether in the elected public office or um, in the executive ranks as well. Um, definitely women or other underrepresented groups would be more, more uh, represented in these, in these structures if there were more support support services and, uh, oh, hi, Charlie. I wouldn't, um, <laughs> to speak from a personal note that, you know, there isn't actually maternity leave provisions in local government. Um, and I was back at, in the council chambers when she was only four weeks old um, because I really wanted to make sure that the bikes on Princess Lane were installed. So I had to go and make sure and make my vote um, counted. But that aside, <laughs> I would like to note and thank Geoffrey um, Taylor, who's in the front row holding Charlie at the moment, that thanks to him, perhaps, you know, over the last 11 years or so of the Melbourne Conversations, we have had 45% of our panellists um, as women. So uh, I think that's a positive note to end on. Um, I would like to, again, thank the guests and thank you for coming along to another great Melbourne Conversation um, conversation tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Councillor Oak. 45% um, is impressive. 33% does tend to be the magic number at which the ceiling seems to kind of sit, and then we'll talk a little bit about that later on when we, um, if we get on to issues of, of women on boards and, and quotas and those kind of issues. So tonight we um, wanted to, we talk about women and work who pays, and everyone likes a pun, but I suppose the concerning thing is that it's not just, um, we're not just talking about issues of equal pay, we're talking about more profound issues that affect women in the workplace, um, even though pay is, is absolutely part of it. Um, I want to introduce my guests in, in more detail. Um, Claire, Dr Claire Wright um, 
She is a historian who's worked as a political speech writer. She's a university lecturer. She's a historical consultant and a radio and television broadcaster. Her first book, Beyond the Ladies' Lounge, um, on Australians, Australia's female publicans garnered a lot of attention at the time. She researched, wrote and presented the ABC documentary Utopia Girls and she's currently writing a four-part series to commemorate the centenary of World War I for ABC. She's working on two other books, Eureka, Sex and Power and The Pursuit of Freedom on the Victorian Frontier and if you're interested to know more about that book, they're going, their brochures on at the front table. You could grab them when you go. And she's also writing a book called Ned Wood, True Adventures in Kelly Country, which is co-authored with historian Alex McDermott. And I think that partly grew out of, a, of an essay that I published many years ago, didn't it? Um, it was an essay that I particularly loved about Ned Kelly's passion for a much older public barmaid, really, a, a much older woman, and we all, you know, I found that quite interesting. Um, Clem Ford, who is going to be speaking to us, is a writer, broadcaster and troublemaker. That's her own descriptive. That's probably a fairly accurate one. And also a T-shirt, making a range of T-shirts, which she might also display for us later on. She a, has a background in feminist and social commentary, pop culture, um, anecdotal memoir and biographical feature. And you, she's writing fairly regularly for Daily Life, among other um, media outlets. And Michelle O'Neill, who is the um, National Secretary, Textile, Clothing and the Secretary of the um, Textile, Clothing and Footwear Union of Australia. She's represented women in the textile, clothing and footwear industry for more than 20 years. She's a member of the ACTU Executive and an executive member of the Global Union Body Industrial. She's an activist for women workers and asylum seekers. So it's a really fantastic range of speakers tonight. I'm very pleased that they um, all agreed to, to, to join me in this conversation. I don't plan to say a lot before we leap in, as I really want our speakers to set tonight's agenda. But I did want to note that the timing for tonight's conversation is um, significant. Um, two days ago, a new Prime Minister and his Cabinet were sworn in. Only one of those 19 ministers is a woman, and there are only six women amongst the 42 leadership roles. And this has come the most male-dominated executive in recent history. And what can be seen as an act of revenge against Gilead, Julia Gillard's misogyny speech, Abbott has appointed himself as Minister for Women. Um, the only positive in that, as and some of this noted, can be seen that at least the um, um, office for Women is now placed in the Prime Minister's office, which traditionally has meant that that um, portfolio receives more attention, though whether that is actually the case, I think, is yet, yet to be seen. Um, the the, the, the um, commentary over the last few days about um, the Cabinet has, has raised several times, well, many times, on um, issues of merit. And a lot of commentary has been saying that gender shouldn't be a priority and that skill set and experience are what considered most important. But I don't think there's enough discussion of what merit actually means. And it also assumes that all the male ministers who have been import, appointed have merit, and certainly some commentators are taking issue with that, and none of the women that missed out had it. Um, I'm quoting Ben Eltham from New Matilda um, on this. He says, as more than a few commentators have observed, including senior women in the Liberal Party, such as Senator Sue Boyce, the women might be knocking, but the door seems firmly shut. Experienced junior ministers such as Susan Lay and Maurice Payne could easily have been brought into the cap cabinet. Talented, talented backbenchers like Kelly O'Dwyer could have, been, have, have found roles as parliamentary secretaries. It's not as though this was a cabinet chosen on merit. And he goes on to kind of detail the kind of expertise of the various ministers. Um, one of the appointments that I'm particularly concerned about is, in, is um, the, the fact that the new Minister for Employment is Erica Betts. Um, and that there is no Minister for Industrial Relations, and that also is very relevant, I think, to the, um, to the role of women in the workplace, or workers in the workplace. Um, and it's, um, but I would say, um, in response to Chris Bowen's comment on all this, um, he, he, made a, he noted that the outgoing Rudd Ministry had six women in Cabinet, and that's good. But he went on to say, the Cabinet of Afghanistan now has more women in it than the Cabinet of Australia. And I don't think that kind of smugness is hugely useful. When we do love focusing on how we're better in these matters in another country and then being terribly surprised when it seems we're not better. And I think the point is that we quite often get it wrong. 
and they were not as removed from the global politics of these things as his statement implies. Certainly, I'm hoping Michelle will elaborate on this, among many things, that the, the, um, the global nature of these kind of politics. And I didn't want to overly focus, in, in talking about what's happening in Cabinet, I wanted to make the point that um, that the things that happen at that level and at a policy level do have a trickle-down effect and do affect all women. I'm not just concerned about um, the fact that some senior women in the Liberal Party may not have got jobs, that I think it, it says something much broader about our, our culture. And feminism is not just a middle-class issue and concerned about uh, the working lives of women who are working at that kind of level. Um, that characterisation of feminism is just one way of dismiss dismissing a movement which, um, after many years in abeyance, is actually developing real attraction, which I assume is why it's, it's creating a lot more aggression, or a lot more aggression is being aimed at feminists in, in recent months. Um, and so, while historically, particularly at the end of the 19th century, middle class women had more time to do activist work, uh, which might be where some of that kind of um, why people do kind of dwell on that particular aspect of feminism. I don't think it's sort of useful or meaningful. But certainly one of the reasons why the, um, I have so many concerns about um, possibilities of decisions that might be made in the upcoming government is that we haven't really recovered from the Howard years. By we, I mean women's and women's rights and workers' rights. And there was a very considered rollback um, um, o over many years, uh, and, I, and I'm not going to detail them all here, but certainly um, childcare was, um, 850 million was taken from childcare between 1996 and the year 2000, which had a huge impact on women's working lives. One of the um, initial impulses behind this was all, um, talking about this subject was actually um, Anne, Cum Anne Summer's statement that if Julia Gillard that, that Julia Gillard had been effectively bullied in her workplace, then that she was bullied out of office in some ways, not simply by the opposition, but by members of her own party. In her gracious concession speech, Gillard said that her gender doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain nothing, it explains some things. She also said she hoped she'd made things easier for women to achieve power in the future. Um, I'm not sh I'd like to share her optimism, but I, I don't. Um, I was very really struck by the fact that on September the 7th, election night, when names were being bandied around about a possible new, who could be a new leader for the ALP, Tanya Plebisek's name, which was racing around social media like wildfire, wildfire was not mentioned once by commentators, that, um, certainly on the ABC, which was the channel that I was watching. And I really got the very strong feeling that the feel that um, the implication was, hey, we tried out a woman once, it didn't work. Um, just a couple more figures I'll throw you away before we leap in. Um, women currently receive um, an average of 17.5% less than me for doing equivalent jobs to men. Um, this has been characterised as a million dollar penalty for being a woman over a lifetime of work. And while arguments have been made and could be made that this is, um, reflects women's lack of negotiation skills, it, that, that kind of characterisation of the issue doesn't take into account that women often start um, their first job, they're often paid less than their male colleagues, so, say in the law, I know that happens. So it's, you, you're always negotiating from a, from a lower base. Um, I'm going to stop myself talking more. Obviously, I kind of would, would have happily talked about that this just all by myself for some hours. But I would like um, Claire, Dr. Wright, now to come and talk to us to create some historical context, even though I also know Claire would have much to say about contemporary issues as well. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Sophie. It's indeed a timely week to be having this public conversation about women and work. As Sophie said, with the most preeminent national workplace, our federal parliament, convulsed by the incoming government's decision to appoint only one woman to cabinet. Now, there's already been miles of newsprint and acres of cyberspace devoted to analysing that decision, with renewed calls for quotas, discussion of the concept of a meritocracy, and a whole heap of mixed metaphors involving glass ceilings and knocking on doors. 
uh, as Sophie has suggested, it's tempting to use this platform to put in my own two cents worth, but I've been asked to speak to you this evening in my professional capacity as an historian, not as a commentator on current affairs. And I should note that I'm very grateful to Sophie for thinking to give an historical perspective on a contemporary issue of great importance and relevance, because this is all too rarely the case. But it does leave me with a dilemma. I have about seven minutes, six now after that waffling preface, to give you the lowdown on over 200 years of Australian women's participation in and relationship to the workforce. And that's only European and other immigrant women, to say nothing of the way that Indigenous Australian women worked to grow, shape and maintain their land, their local economies and their families. So perhaps I'll begin by telling you what I'm not going to talk about tonight. I'm not going to tell you about the 19th century female factories in New South Wales and Tasmania, where an estimated 9,000 convict women worked for no pay to manufacture commodities like spun wool, cotton and linen, on which the new colonies relied for both domestic use and export. An 1827 riot at the Parramatta Female Factory over a cut in rations and poor conditions is considered to be the first industrial action staged by women in Australia. When the Parramatta Female Factory was closed in 1848, the building, interestingly enough, was reassigned as a lunatic asylum. And I'm certainly not going to tell you about an incident at the Cascades Female Factory in 1838, when the inmates of this forced labour camp were being lectured on morality by a visiting preacher. Growing weary of his cant, a witness recorded what happened next. The 300 women turned right around and at one impulse pulled up their clothes showing their naked posteriors, which they simultaneously smacked with their hands, making a loud and not very musical noise. It might have been the first recorded instance of, um, what's it called? No, not twerking. No, not mooning either. Oh, you know, you've done one. Um, the flash mob. Might have been the first flash mob, literally. <clears throat> I also won't tell you about the Tayloresses Association of Melbourne, Australia's first female trade union, which was established in 1882. The association formed after attempts by a Melbourne clothing manufacturer to reduce piece rate wages. A strike involving over a thousand women was held early the following year. And this strike is generally accepted as instrumental in the eventual passage of the Factory Act. Nor will I discuss the remarkable Louisa Dunkley, daughter of a Catholic bootmaker from Richmond, who entered the Postmaster General's Department in 1882 as a junior assistant and was soon working as a fully qualified telegraphist. Telegraphy was one of the first technological industries that was open to women. Concerned by the injustice in women's pay rates in the Victorian public service, Louisa organised and presented a successful case for equal pay to the Post and Telegraphic Department 1895, in an age when women's work in the public sphere was being dramatically curtailed. You'll recall that this is the era of the marriage bar, which would in fact last until 1966. But how many of you would know that the marginal liberal seat of Dunkley in Melbourne's outer southeast was named after Louisa in recognition of her work as one of Australia's pioneering union officials? And I wouldn't think to mention the part that suffrage campaigner and anti-war activist Vida Goldstein played in the establishment of the famous Harvester Judgment of 1907, which paved the way for the establishment of the basic or living wage in Australia and was one of the hallmarks of the newly federated Australia's famed reputation as a working man's paradise. In establishing what was a fair and reasonable wage, Justice Higgins was influenced by an article that Goldstein had recently published on socialism. That article persuaded Higgins to allow working men and women to give evidence as to their usual living expenses, including the price of newspapers, books, alcohol, public transport costs, and life insurance, to name a few. These hearings in turn led to Higgins settling on a minimum wage that would keep a man and his family in reasonable and frugal comfort, denying employers the ability to, quote, withhold 
from his employees the reasonable conditions of human existence. Now, I've only just entered the 20th century, but I hope as it's becoming apparent, I could in fact stand here all evening and list the things I'm not going to talk about. And I've only touched on aspects of women in the industrial workforce, not women's relationship to work in their homes or in the professions or in boardrooms or on the black market. But I've only got a couple of minutes left now to tell you about the time and the place in Australian history that has exercised my imagination for the best part of the last 10 years. The Ballarat Goldfields of 1854. This is the time we most readily associate with the flowering of democratic sentiment that is the heart of Australia's political and industrial heritage. The time when, at the Eureka Stockade, men fought to defend their rights and liberties when they achieved that which no other country yet had, the vote for working men without property. And when Australia's tradition of collectivism and unity in struggle against oppression and injustice is thought to begin. I've spent the last decade writing the thousands of women who were in Ballarat in 1854 back into that foundation story. And that story will be published in a book uh, in about four weeks' time called The Forgotten Rebels of Eureka. Reconfiguring, what I've been doing is reconfiguring the gold mining community as young couples and working families, not individual men on the make. Identifying and documenting the remarkable women who were leaders in the people's movement against government corruption and taxation without representation. Reconstructing the early gold rush as a time and a place that was not some sort of lawless deadwood with only a few prostitutes and a laudanum soaked genteel woman out of her depth to add spice, but rather a golden moment of economic and social opportunity where women were temporarily unfettered by the chains of industrial control and its patriarchal methods of gatekeeping. For a brief time, women wore the pants, literally, financially and creatively. They imagined the world anew. They bankrolled the diggers' cause. They saved many a family of European boat people from starvation. They stood in the middle of the stockade and took the bullets. And then the times changed and they were forgotten. And that brings me now to the question, women and work, who pays? And my answer is, we pay. We all pay. Our collective memory, our public culture, our political consciousness. We accumulate a psychic national deficit by failing to remember the moments when women stood together, together as sisters and together with men to defend their right to work with dignity, in safety and for adequate civic and fiduciary recompense. We pay by failing to remember the women who stood up as leaders and mobilisers in the mass popular movements to make Australia the iconic working man's paradise we are proud it once was. And we pay every time Tony Abbott says something like he said in his swearing in ceremony two days ago. He said this, we won't forget those who are often marginalised, people with disabilities, indigenous people, and women struggling to combine career and family. I'm sorry, women are not marginal. Women are not a minority. And the narrative of struggle, with its implied denouement of failure, perpetuates the myth that women have only ever been knocking at the door of Australia's story. Struggling, not angry. Excluded, not in the thick of it. Grateful, not entrepreneurial, passively waiting to be remembered, not banging loudly to be heard. I want to leave you with a small episode in this grand tale of recalcitrance. In 1876, in Clunes, Victoria, the directors of the Lothair Gold Mining Company moved to introduce Chinese labour to undercut wages. The salary miners rallied. When Ch Chinese workers were brought from Creswick in two coaches under police escort, the miners and their families picketed the mine sites. One of the two roads into town was blockaded. 
A miner later recounted what he saw on that road. Nearby was a heap of road metal, and arming herself with a few stones, a sturdy North of Ireland woman, without shoes or stockings, mounted the barricade as the coaches drew up. As she did, she called out to the other women, saying, Come on, you cousin Jennies, bring me the stones and I will fire them. The sergeant in charge of the police presented his carbine at the woman and ordered her to back down. Her answer was to bare her breast and say to him, shoot away and be damned to you. Better be shot than starve to death. We all pay because by forgetting that Australia's women have always been workers, have always balanced work and family, have always stood up to be counted, we deny future generations of women and the men with whom we share half this world the opportunity to look at their own history for inspiration and expectation. Thanks. And now Michelle is going to, I uh, asked Michelle originally to talk about um, globalisation and the female workforce, but I do know that um, current political affairs are also might be something she'll want to touch on. Thanks, Sophie. And I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we met on tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And Sophie did ask me to talk about globalisation and women workers. And in thinking about what I was going to say, I uh, came across an article, there's a industry rag, appropriately called Rag Trader, in the textile, clothing and footwear industry here in Australia. And in the September article of Rag Trader, there's a columnist who has a column each uh, month. And the title of his column this month is Still Banging On About Bangladesh. And the purpose of his column is to basically describe that uh, really, as you can get from the title, um, that it's a problem, this, uh, this campaigning against what's happening for the garment workers in Bangladesh because they need us. They need us to be in there having our clothes made. Well, I want to still bang on about Bangladesh tonight. And I want to tell you a little bit about, well, let's start the story, in fact, on the 23rd of April this year and in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And on that day, there was about 3,500 workers working in the Rana Plaza building. And the Rana Plaza building was an eight-storey high building, five storeys of which had been sort of approved under Bangladesh law to be built, but three storeys on the top had been built without any permit. And the mainly young women workers who worked inside Rana Plaza were, came from villages around Bangladesh into the city to try and earn what was, if they were receiving the minimum wage, 38 US dollars a month for the work in those five factories. Now, the bottom couple of floors didn't have factories in it. There was a bank, there were some shops. And the 23rd was the day that the workers noticed the cracks in the pillars that held up the building. And it was during the afternoon that people actually got sent home. They got taken out of the building and there was some sort of inspection done. The next morning, the workers turned up on the 24th and were a bit nervous about going outside, inside. But the owner of the building was there and as were the managers of the factories and they assured the workers that the building was safe, that there'd been inspectors that had checked it out. The owner said, I'll go in. And uh, the workers were still very nervous about going into that building, but under the threat by the bosses that they would lose a month or two months pay, and in some cases on the basis of being beaten with sticks, they went into work. When they were in there, it was by about 8.30, commonly in Bangladesh, the power doesn't last and the power went out. And in this building, there were many generators that were used for those circumstances. So the generators started up. So imagine, it's hot, it's steamy, it's dim, there's not very good lighting, and it's really loud and the place vibrates. <laughs> 
Workers were sitting at their machines watching the cracks grow on the walls. And it was only a very short time later that the building collapsed around them. And those mainly young women, uh, we now know 1,133 of them died that day. Uh, more than 1,000 more really seriously injured. And by injuries, you've got to also remember that for those that survived, many survived on the basis of their co-workers having to amputate their limbs to get them out. And they used, they made, they were ingenious, they made makeshift slides to get out of the upper areas, out of the material that they'd been sewing. So we can't talk about women and work in the world today without starting with the women workers of the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh. And some jobs I know are life-threatening. You think about it, there's people that go to work every day knowing they're doing a job that at some point they might put their life at risk. Think about our firefighters, courageous workers who know the sort of work they do um, means that they'll face that sort of risk. But really, in 2013, do you think you should risk your life sitting behind a sewing machine making our clothes? So how do we deal with the fact that one of the worst industrial tragedies and, and definitely, I say, industrial homicides that we've ever seen in the world and definitely in the garment sector um, happened when it was simply workers being forced back into an unsafe building to make clothes for the Western world. And what's all this got to do with Melbourne and a conversation in Melbourne in uh, September of 2013? Well, firstly, we've got to say that Bangladesh is not the only place on earth that workers and women workers get exploited making our clothes. Right here in Springvale today, or in St Albans tomorrow, my union comes across workers that are working, sewing in their own garages or homes, lounge rooms, bedrooms, making our clothes for rates of pay that are as low as five, six, seven dollars an hour. And these workers, they don't get any superannuation, they don't get any workers' comp, annual leave, long service leave, personal leave, parental leave. They're told they're contractors. To get the work, they're told they have to have a business name, pay their own way, and uh, they have to bid for the price to get the job and basically try and feed themselves and their families. So yes, right here in our town, we've got sweatshops. And right here in our town, we find sweatshops where the doors are barricaded with piles of material and junk and boxes, where workers are, are locked in at the beginning of a shift and where they're told that they will be timed if they go to the toilet. This is 2013 in Melbourne. So this is an example of globalisation at its most vicious. And we have to unpack what that is about. Because you don't, as a brand, choose either the cheapest place in Melbourne or the cheapest place in the globe, being Bangladesh, to make your clothes and not know the consequence of that action. Because the consequence of finding the cheapest is that you are not paying a living wage that you are compromising workers' safety and, as we know, their lives, and you are punishing union organising and workers' attempts to get a better life. Brands deliberately develop a strategy to distance themselves from the employment relationship. Not many have their own factories anymore. We have long, complex webs of supply chains, and at the very bottom of that supply chain, you'll find the outworker or the worker in Rana Plaza. And they do this so they can wash the hands of the responsibility. That's not us, that's some other business. We didn't know our work was there. We didn't agree to that sort of condition. Well, don't be fooled, because it's their product. It's their profit. It's their responsibility. Globalisation in this industry has this now converse effect where the more that a business's value is its brand, and we know that, we, we're shoppers, we see how much value we place in brands and the premium that people pay for it, but the converse 
effect that the more the value is in the brand, the more likely that that brand has done to distance itself, has taken real efforts to distance itself from those people who actually make the product and that brand. And there's something perverse something really perverse about seeking our loyalty as consumers to a brand at the same time as having no loyalty or responsibility to the people that actually make the product. Or even more starkly, that you want to increase your profits, that you actually want to have a huge markup and have all of the benefits that come with what is, in many cases, quite obscene profits and profit margins, based on finding the lowest possible wages, the worst conditions, the youngest, poorest, ununionized women. So what have we got? We've got brand power on the back of the poorest who have the least power. So, yep, I'm still banging on about Bangladesh. And I'm a unionist, and the role of unions is really important in this because I honestly believe that if on that morning of the 24th of April, if those workers had been unionised and if they'd had some leaders amongst them who had the confidence of the other workers to say, no, we're not going in, then those lives would have been saved. Because what I know from my experience of unionism, from the struggles that you heard Claire speak about, is that it's only through that sort of collective strength, that collective action, knowing that you're not alone, that you won't be singled out, that you're not the only one, that you can actually overcome fear, that you can fight back, and that you can win, and that you can, in this case, save lives. So unions often get a bad rap, and my union often gets criticised for talking about the horrors of this industry instead of talking about its greatness. Well, I love this industry, I love fashion, I uh, think we make some very beautiful clothes, I think we have great designers, I think we have a future. But if we don't have a future that's based on a fundamental ethical approach to the making of clothes, then what sort of industry do we want to have? And it is, I think, important that we think, well, what can we do to change this? Because it isn't just about believing what companies say. Don't believe what they tell you about their corporate social responsibility. Do not let companies self-regulate. Many of the workers um, who are making those brands in, those, in that factory in Rana Plaza or the ones that we see each week here in Melbourne have companies that on their website sound so beautiful. The only way you can be sure that you are getting an ethical product is if there's genuine involvement of unions in a process, if there's real and regulated and enforceable laws, if there's codes that are not company-specific codes, if there's audits that aren't done by private companies paid by the companies themselves, but audits that are actually involving workers and unions in them. Don't believe what you're told. Make sure that you fight for a change in this because we want to be able to have a world where we actually can be proud of the conditions of the people that make the products that we're spending our hard-earned money on. So demand some transparency of this and there's ways we can do it. And I do want to end with talking about Tony Abbott because these things are connected. It's not unconnected that of one of the few things that the now uh, Liberal Coalition government has said they're going to do about ind industrial relations blatantly. One of the few things they've said is they're going to change Australia's right of entry laws. Now, this is not a very interesting topic. People go, what's right of entry? Well, right of entry is what gives me a right as a union official to go into a factory or a workplace and see what's happening and talk to the workers and see if they want to organise and mobilise and check whether their paying conditions are OK and whether the building's safe. That's what right of entry is. And he's going to change it so that right here in those sweatshops in Melbourne, instead of us being able to walk in the door and see what's going on, uh, we'll only be allowed, unions will only be allowed in workplaces if there's members already in there and if then an individual member says, I want my union to come in. Now put that in a sweatshop and imagine how hard that is.
what courage that will take. They'll do it. There's some extraordinary, courageous, fantastic, inspirational uh, members and workers, um, uh, members of my union and workers here and around the world in this industry. I don't have to talk about the, uh, the fantastic um, women who, in fact, are the mothers of my union that you've already heard from Claire, who struggled in the 1880s here, or the women who fought um, on the streets of New York for better conditions after the Triangle Fire, or the women who are fighting now in Bangladesh for changes in laws and rights. We know they're there, we know they're strong. And I reckon, in 2013, it can't be a job at any price. It's not too much to ask for a living wage for a safe workplace and for a bit of dignity. So I'm gonna still bang on about Bangladesh, thanks. Clem, uh, uh, Clem Ford is now gonna to speak to us, and I asked her to certainly to touch upon um, Abbott's paid parental leave scheme, um, but also to talk about another, another form of piecemeal work is freelance work, which is something that I'm aware of particularly affecting younger people, and but but it also is happening up all, all kinds of industries. Journalism just being one of them, where people are being forced more and more into um, freelance workforces. If that's a contradiction in terms, Clem. Thanks very much for that, Sophie. And um, I am wearing one of the T-shirts that I made post the election. It says baddie, it's in reference to uh, Tony Abbott's incredibly in-depth assessment of the situation in Syria. And I was gonna make a little joke when I came up here about how, because the orders were so overwhelming and I'm not a retailer at all and I don't really understand how to organize my life either. And I was gonna make a little joke about how my living room has been turned into a sweatshop. But I feel like if I made that now, I would actually feel sick after hearing um, everything that Michelle and Claire had to say. So. Um, I guess at this point it's worth acknowledging that the kind of things I'm going to talk about are conversely also the problem of modern feminism now, which is that it, it fixates really on a, a pretty privileged kind of womanhood. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a white middle class feminist. I don't face the same issues of the women that um, we've talked about tonight, and I have actually often thought, particularly because I'm a freelance writer, but, uh, often thought that a union wasn't really relevant to me, and I think that that's a privilege in itself that I can, uh, I, I'm not necessarily saying that that's true, but that I can have that kind of idea that I can self-govern to an extent and at the same time still be annoyed and irritated by the ways in which myself and women around me are, are kept out of particular halls of power, but they're still it, we still have access that other women don't, and um, I think that that's a really important point for me to make in terms of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, also, filled with rage listening to all of the things being said tonight, because I just can't believe that we've elected a coalition government again, and I can't believe that Tony Abbott has had the audacity to appoint himself as the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, and I feel like forgive my language, but I feel like that's just a giant fuck you to all of the women who've all you know, consistently pointed out the problem that he absolutely does have with them. And I think that um, Sophie asked me to talk about the paid parental leave scheme, and I'll talk a little bit about that now, but I'll give the disclaimer that I don't have a child, and so I've never been forced into the position where I've had to worry about childcare and the balance of work, and also how I would balance even being able to work whilst raising a child, whether or not I had the support of a partner or not. So I'm speaking about this very theoretically, which can be a problem for some people when um, discussing issues like this. I think it's, it can be frustrating when you hear people, obviously, who don't have direct experience. So I'll just give that little disclaimer. But my assessment of the paid parental leave scheme, particularly as posed by Tony Abbott, is that one of the things that the, um, he and Joe Hockey have always said about it is that it will encourage women to remain in the workplace. And when I sat down and thought about that, I mean, apart from taking away all of the kind of ideas about middle-class welfare that absolutely do exist and attach themselves to the paid parental leave scheme, one of the problems that I have with the suggestion that it will encourage women to stay in the workforce is that it doesn't. It gives uh, certainly a very generous six-month uh, sum of pay for women to stay at home and 
raise their children in the first six months of that baby's life uh, without having to worry about pay, and that's certainly something that we need to institute. Um, whether or not it's at the exact levels that they've planned to, I'm not sure, but um, particularly not on a sliding scale. But I think that what it actually does is it encourages women to stay at, at home once that maternity leave scheme is finished, because this isn't a scheme that really addresses, even though the, the coalition mentioned quite consistently not the middle class women and middle to upper class women who would benefit most from this scheme, but consistently mentioned women who would be working in cafes or in retail jobs um, paid by the hour, uh, cited those women as being probably some of the primary beneficiaries of this paid parental leave scheme because previously uh, such a scheme has been denied to them in terms of being able to keep their jobs for six months. Um, but the people who are really targeted by this scheme are the middle class women who are so often forced into a position of saying, well, is it worth the money for me to spend on childcare to go back to work once that maternity leave scheme is finished? When you're talking about women who are earning up upwards of $100,000 a year or you know, to $150,000 as the scheme is capped at, you're really talking about women who've been uh, mostly, n not in all cases, but mostly supported by um, class, privilege, education, networking, to be able to access jobs that pay such exorbitant salaries. And I think $150,000 a year is quite exorbitant for anyone. Um, so the, the idea that they would stay out of the workforce once a child is born is not really something worth addressing because in some cases maybe, but I would contend that most women who've worked to that point will figure out some way possible to stay in the workforce and also have the financial benefit of being able to hire private care for their child. Women who are below a certain salary bracket are probably not in the position where they can negotiate being able to stay out of the workforce, particularly if they're single mothers because we don't have a welfare system that benefits single mothers and both the previous government and this current government are taking money away from single mothers and single parents. So that's kind of not really something that um, is going to be addressed by this scheme either. This is a middle class, this is a, a, a targeting middle class women who, when you talk about childcare and going back to work, the consistent reply that you hear from a lot of women is, that we balanced up both of our salaries and we realised that it wouldn't make sense for me to go back to work because I was only bringing home $20 a week after the childcare was paid for. And so I think this is a really key point about the women and work who pays. That when it comes to childcare and when it comes to women remaining in the workplace, it's assumed on a, on a deeply kind of socially unquestioned level that women pay for the childcare, that the... Um, the exchange for them being entitled to go back to work as opposed to staying at home and doing the real job of taking care of, the, of her child in this instance, is that she be able to bring in enough money that will justify that. And this is something that's not often questioned by a lot of people because it's really easy to do the maths and say, well, I don't understand if the, you know, the other parent is bringing home $50,000 a year and she's bringing home $35,000 a year, it doesn't matter whether or not you take it out of both of their salaries because it's all still the same money in the end. But it's not the same money. People still earn their, earn their own separate salaries. And apart from the fact that it's really, really important for women and, and historically has been vital for women to be able to gain financial independence in order to, to have their own self-determination and their own independence and escape from situations which may be violent or abusive, um, it's not her responsibility to pay for the childcare, regardless of whether or not at the end of the day the sums all end up the same. And this is the idea of who pays. That the childcare is still considered to be very much the realm of the woman. And her right to work is contingent upon whether or not she can sort out something that's financially um, sensible for both parties. The right for them, for them, and most often in this case, the right for the father or the male to work is never in question. So I think that that's really something that needs to be exposed about the paid parental leave scheme, is that it's not designed, as the coalition claims, to keep women in the workforce, but it's designed to bring middle-class women out of the workforce. And uh, as Tony Abbott has even said, in conjunction with saying that it's to keep them in the workforce, he is hoping that it will result in a baby boom. So this is very much a regressive policy that looks very flashy and nice with lots of money, but actually is designed to pull women out of the workforce.
And I think that then that goes back to the rageful kind of decisions that have been made this week in terms of the cabinet. And um, I'll just check the time, how much I've got left. So I'm trying to speak qu quickly. <laughs> um, that the idea of merit, and I'm sure that we'll talk a little bit more about this when I sit down, but the idea of merit is also something that's trotted out as just an accepted fact. That, as Sophie mentioned in her opening um, speech, it's, women are assumed to have to prove their merit to become part of any kind of system of power. And it's not just women who are expected to prove their merit, it's marginalised groups. And I know that women are not a marginal group, they are treated like a marginalised group. And the people who exist out of the dominant power structure are always the ones who are expected to demonstrate their right to break into it. The people who exist in, in the power structure never have to demonstrate anything and they never have to answer to the fact that that is never about merit but always about reward and about um, helping each other up to perpetuate the dominant structure. I mean, how else can you explain Barnaby Joyce and the front bench? This is basically a system that said that Barnaby Joyce, a man who two years ago said that uh, he opposed same-sex marriage because he knew that the best protection for his daughters was for them to get into safe marriages with men. I don't even know what that means. That he is more meritorious than six other women. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not saying that necessarily those women should be on the front bench, but they shouldn't be kept off the front bench because they haven't proved their merit in a system that has historically always favoured white heterosexual men of most, mostly of privilege. So this idea that merit is somehow uh, automatically attached to people's elevation into power is completely ludicrous. And we never ever ask the people who already experience the privilege and the power to demonstrate that they have the merit to be there in the first place. I think that probably ties in the two ideas pretty well and uh, I will sit down now. <laughs> but I did just want to say quickly that I do agree with Sophie about that, that meme about the cabinet of Afghanistan now has more women. Because I don't think that it's ever helpful to compare um, systems in which women are being oppressed or discriminated against because you're taking a voice away from those women as well. And my favourite meme personally was the one which said that Voldemort's women, Voldemort's cabinet had more women in it than Tony Abbott's. So maybe we can go with that. <laughs> I'm going to ask questions from here rather than, than um, go up to the lectern. There are so many things I, I would like to take, um, know more about female factories. We're not going to have time for any of that and I'm, I'm really sorry. I had one question that I wanted to touch on that certainly I know that um, Anne Summers and others have argued that one way you can change corporate cultures and one would hope that that would, would trickle down is to have um, women on boards, but that um, simply having a woman on a board does not necessarily make all the difference required. Uh, that you need a kind of actually a sort of a critical mass of women, which tends to be at, at least three women. Um, Anna Crean also wrote about that in her book Night Games, talking about women on the, um, the boards of sporting very sporting um, organisations um, and this was um, around issues of um, sexual violence within sport and, and that if, if women had a stronger, more powerful presence within those kind of sporting bodies that the culture could be shifted. One way that has been um, discussed to kind of try and resolve some of these issues about the fact there are so few women on boards, it is much better in government boards and community boards than it is in corporate boards, but by better I mean 30% max. Um, for um, corporate boards it's probably more like about 14%. Um, one of the issues that comes up is that of, of having a quota and I think the whole issue of quotas is an interesting one and it does become a very contentious one and I suppose I was just curious to know what um, people, your views were on, on having quotas on boards but more generally the issue of quotas to try and address some of the kind of imbalances. I know that Claire, you were going to said that you might um, give us a little, uh, me a little bit of an idea of the history of, of, of quotas on boards, but you might, yeah. <coughs> and whether they've worked, whether it's come up in the past, and what's happened. Well, of course, the the issue has come up um, over and over again, and the idea of affirmative action is one that that is um, that recycles, and. 
I think the idea behind them is that you have them for a short period of time and they make a difference and then you can move you can move on for it so, from it so that there is and there has been success in in those um, bringing up the balances in certain things and and um, whether that's race or gender and bringing you know quotas into having blacks in in um, universities in America was one that was was tried and and um, but then you get the backlash against them as well and that's the thing that is part of that cycle as well so that people start to feel that uh, I'm Remember, this is just anecdotally. This isn't um, historically um, evidenced. But um, I was recently um, on a surfing expedition with my children in an island off Bali, and we were talking to a South African man who was talking about the blacks. And he was in um, oil and gas in Angola. My husband started referring to him as Mr. Oil and Gas in Angola. And, and he was talking about how it was um, terrible that the... That the that the black kids there could get into the schools with much lower grades than the white kids could. And, uh, and surely by now, they should be up to the same level. And he was talking about, between the ending of apartheid and now, mm. that there wouldn't need to be any more, and that they were basically manipulating and using the system. And so I think that this is the problem, is that we end up talking about things in really short timelines in terms of, yeah, I mean, change it, takes a long time. It, it mm. Change takes a long time. I mean, women fought for over 100 years to get the vote. By the way, happy Women's Suffrage Day, everybody. It's 120 years today since New Zealand women became the first in the world to win the vote. And um, so, you know, women fought for, for, for decades and, and just to, to start to get those first ones. And then, then, you know, women in France didn't get the vote until 1945. Women in Switzerland didn't get the vote until the 1970s. So, you know, these things are not ancient. We're not, it's true. These things are not ancient history. And so I think that it is, I think that it's actually, uh, I mean, I'm actually an optimist. And I, and I think that change does come. And I think that you do need to have things like quotas and affirmative action for a time where they can make a difference, start to chip away at the culture, and then in time we won't need them. But that time might not have come yet. I always think it's really interesting how people expect that change will have happened in such a short period of time. Like, you know, you often hear feminism's achieved all of its goals, so what are you all complaining about? You know, the subject's being, so why don't you shut up and go home? In 40 years since the second wave, 40, 40 years has overturned. And it's actually got worse I mean, statistically, which I won't sort of launch into the figures, but actually there was a huge amount of energy in the 80s and yeah. um, 70s and 80s around women's rights, and since that energy has dissipated for various reasons. Well, it's the, much the figures easier, have got worse. It's much easier to pretend that equality has been achieved now because so much of it has been legislated. It doesn't mean that, you know, you can say that women are supposed to be uh, earning the same amount of money, but it doesn't mean that that's actually going to happen. You know, you can say that it's illegal to rape your wife now, but that doesn't mean that a structure and culture surrounding sexual violence has been destroyed. Um, so this idea that somehow all of this oppression and discrimination has somehow ended because of one particular event or a series of events, not only is incorrect, but it also kind of has this subtle message that, well, up until that point, we had the power to give you all of this freedom, but, and we've given it to you now, so what are you complaining about? Um, but the idea of quotas being somehow regressive or unfair is also, it completely ignores to me the fact that we have quotas already. And that's a quota that favours men, because um, Kathy it's not, mentioned it's not a legal one, even though I totally no, but it, take but it is. Point. But it's it's consistent. And when you look across the board, I don't mean boards, but as Kathy said before, thirty percent of uh, only thirty percent of councillors are women, and this thirty percent figure is something that comes up all the time when you're looking at the rates of, of women in any kind of visible positions of power. It's all throughout the media. It's a, it's a pretty much 70, 30% split in terms of journalists, radio presenters, people who are on TV, and, and even then on TV, you've got all these other kind of things to worry about as well. Um, and that's, that's pretty standard and, and has been constant for quite a while now. So I feel like quotas already exist and they don't favour 
the people who actually would benefit from them. You know, and so this idea of like, we need to get 30% of women on boards, that would just be really kind of reinforcing the status quo. Well, well, in fact, but there tends to be even less than 30%. No, I know, I know. That's, that's, bringing it up, the, that's bringing it up to the status yeah. quo already. Michelle? Yeah, look, I support the need for affirmative action in quotas. I think you have to have a program and you've got to fight for every step of it. But I also don't think it, it works by itself. And, you know, the union movement's a great example of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, where the density of women in unions is increasing, in fact... Um, union density amongst women workers now compared to men is greater. And there's been huge changes in terms of the unionisation of women in Australia over the last few decades, but still when you look at our movement, uh, the majority of leaders of the union movement are still predominantly men. But here in the ACTU, we've got a 50% um, of the executive is made up of women, which you think, well, that's great. And on one level it is, because you go into this big room and half the people in there usually, not always there, but, you know, theoretically, half of them are women. But then if you look at who's there, uh, the, a number of the women there aren't actually in positions of power or authority. Mm. So they're in the room, but they don't speak. Or they're in the room. Or they're knocking at the door. Or, to or they're in they're in the room, but they have to defer to the senior male official who's also in the room next to them. So, I'm not saying that's a bad thing that we've enshrined the 50%. But I'd say, and I support it. But I think it's an example of you have to do more than just have the quota and just have the affirmative action. Yeah. You have to do a hell of a lot more to make power real. I've, um, I've got one more question, but if people want to start thinking of their questions or get to a microphone while we're just talking for another couple of minutes, that would be great, because we really like to take questions from the audience. One of the... Um, the question that's been nagging at me, and it's really to your um, point about optimism, Claire, yeah. is um, I know that... And the argument's been put by several commentators, and it was certainly put by Jeff Sparrow and The Guardian, I think, yesterday, um, that... Tony Abbott um, is affecting, effectively trolling the liberal left. That is, his, he, um, say, making himself minister for women's mm -hmm. affairs is being deliberately provocative in a way that is useful um, to very... Because uh, it... Um, also, say, the refusal to even use the phrase industrial relations, that it's kind of strategic and it's actually... It fuels the government's sense of its own agenda. It strengthens supporters' sense of righteousness. That it, um, so that the fact that you know people like me might get whipped up about it is actually quite handy for them. Um, and if there, it's, there's possibly some truth in that argument, and but it has left me trying to work out how can what constructive work can we do to continue to advocate for women's rights and indeed a range of rights climate. I mean, there are any number of issues where this question is relevant, where um, simply ending up sort of bouncing off the walls about it doesn't really seem to get us far, but we certainly have to keep the conversation going and <laughs> any strategies would be welcome, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Are you very keen to hear? I actually asked Twitter today what people thought they would do in response to this issue and several people suggested starting a distillery and various other... <laughs> <laughs> slightly <laughs> putting their head under the pillow, but... I suppose uh, union work is a kind of... Has, obviously has a long and noble history of continuing to kind of keep working through these particular issues. Yeah. We've, we sort of um, are survivors. Um, but I suppose what I think is you change the conversation because I think there is a degree of arrogance, there's a degree of, you know, in your face, we're going to, you know, we've won, <laughs> we're going we're to do it. Um, and I think that uh, it's... I suppose I inherently believe in... Uh, I'm also an optimist. I inherently believe that if you give people real information and dispel myths and actually tell real stories about lives and what's happening to people and challenge the dominant story on the basis of the reality, then that's an incredibly powerful thing. So I suppose I'm less interested in sort of... And we actually had an interesting private conversation about um, thinking that part of the psychology of our new Prime Minister is he gets off a little bit on people's mm. sort of 
<laughs> yeah, being, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being affronted um, by him. So I sort of think, don't give him that power in some ways. Like, I, I challenge the argument, challenge the, the facts. Uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, this has been a great issue around asylum seekers, of course, in the previous government as well as this one. Part of the great shame we have of Australian leaders is that they weren't telling the Australian population the truth or the facts, um, and instead people are allowed to, um, you know, wallow in what is just lies about the reality of what's happening in our borders mm -hmm. and the number of people that are arriving by boat and the potential threat of that. So I actually think the great power is changing the conversation, mm -hmm. changing the rules of the debate and not engaging where he's trying to get us to engage. I'd also say it's about changing who you're having the conversation with, not just the conversation. Mm, yeah. I mean, the thing that, um, that I feel least optimistic about is some of the um, ways in which we now communicate. Uh, because I think Twitter and Facebook um, are echo chambers and we end up bouncing back to the same people who already think what we think in the first place. And, and the more that you actually step outside of that, you realise um, that, you that you are in a bubble and that people don't mm. think the same as you. Mm. And I'm increasingly... Um, come, I think that technology is wonderful on one level because it does... It has democratised so many forms of communication, but on another level it's added to a form of, um, of isolation and atomisation of society. And I'm actually coming much more around to the sort of things that you're talking about, Michelle, in terms of of collectivism. I mean, if you look at the ways that women have historically changed things, it's by acting in large groups, in unison, and, and working to mobilise large forces of women together mm -hmm. to push for the same agenda and to push for change. And, and I think that's where we have to be consolidating our efforts. Uh, because I'm optimistic, actually, that, that um, that, that Abbott and his government could implode through this form of conservatism, because I don't think people voted for them to do this stuff. I think he shut up for as long as he possibly could, and now he's got to talk, mm. um, and they just let the Labor Party implode around them because they knew that that was going to happen. But I don't think people voted for this. And, and you know, when Victoria, when Joan Kerner's government was wiped away in a landslide and Jeff Kennett came in, he only got seven years. Mm. He destroyed a lot of stuff, but... It wasn't, it wasn't a generation. It wasn't a lost generation afterwards. Mm. That's that's, what, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, Clem, you should... Oh, no, I was just going to say that's my optimism as well, that now mm. that Tony Abbott... There was a lot of talk about how the coalition ran such a disciplined mm. campaign. Well, it was disciplined in the sense that they never let him speak, you know? Mm. Um, and I have a negative idea about... I think that, unfortunately, and maybe it's part of that echo chamber thing, maybe it's not... I think that we live in the kind of society where a lot of people aren't necessarily interested in facts. Mm. And they say things like, well, no, nah, I don't reckon that that's true, when you mm. actually present them with a fact. And then when you challenge them on it further, they say, well, I'm entitled to my opinion. And you're like, but your opinion is not based on facts. On the flip side of that, my optimism came from looking at the numbers of uh, who didn't lose their seats mm. in the election. And I think it was much less of a landslide victory than was expected. And whether or not that is a reflection of the actual mood of the electorate or just uh, evidence that the media can't dictate mm. what that mood is. I'm not sure, but I think that, that mm. that's something to take heart from, mm. is that it's not quite as bad as maybe well, we thought. I, I think, yes <laughs> and no, they didn't of, have a landslide because they got rid of Gillard. Yeah, and, and, and I they also... they knew that. So that's, that's not that heartening. And a Labor government getting well, in wouldn't fix, wouldn't, wouldn't fix some of these broader issues no, that, we're, no. that we're talking about as well. Um, but do we, we do we have any questions? Good evening, ladies. My name's Elizabeth, and um, I want to shamelessly plug an organisation I actually represent. It's called Behind Closed Doors. And, um, and the reason I'm here tonight is because you talk about women on boards. Yeah. The premise of the organisation is to actually get more women on boards in terms of raising the profile of women and in leadership positions. So that's what it's actually about. Interesting. I had a conversation today with uh, a very dynamic entrepreneurial lady who has grown her consultancy business. She's came from a corporate environment, branched out on her own now. And she said, there is no glass ceiling. I don't believe there's a glass ceiling. And it's, it, and it's which I thought was an interesting, because we keep hearing this all the time. And I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, well, 
It's only a perception. It's, it's, to me, it's just a myth. It's, because she says, I've never, I've never come up against any men stopping me to do what I need to do. And so I, that really got me intrigued in terms of thinking about, you know, these things that we keep reinforcing in, in our own language and we keep perpetuating the glass ceilings, we have to knock on the door. But are you well, saying that women are perpetuating the glass ceilings? Well, maybe we, we, are, maybe we need to rethink, is there a glass ceiling? I mean, you know, you, you hear, does it really exist? Or are we creating that for ourselves? I mean, you know, I, just, I thought it was just curious how she sort of reflected there is no glass ceiling. I thought, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> considering you keep hearing this glass ceiling thing I all think the time. I think one of the reasons that I mentioned in my talk that, um, say, on issues of, with, with pay gaps, um, that some people say one of the reasons women don't, aren't paid as well as men is that they um, don't negotiate as hard, which is to your point. Um, but in fact, certainly, and this was a few years ago, um, women who were starting as lawyers in New South Wales at most major law, um, corporate lawyer um, law firms were often being paid quite substantially less than men who were starting on the ground floor. And I think if there actually is a kind of structural equality, equality like that, simply being more assertive and savvy and sassy doesn't, in itself, while it, they, those qualities can end up being useful in the workplace, they don't actually resolve those, but, those yeah. which I do, I suppose I do think there are structural issues, that it's not just about attitude. Well, and there's always going to be people who, there's always exceptions, and I don't think that one exception or even a handful of exceptions because they've experienced personal um, evidence that this doesn't exist for them. I mean, we're not looking at all of the other things that may be contributing to that success and that might be education, uh, class, income bracket in the first place. I feel like those arguments are not only completely discount all of the many women who are not benefited by those things, but are also incredibly selfish because they assume that one person's success is representative of what everyone can achieve. As if, and it just goes back to the merit mm -hmm. argument, as if merit is something that, as if merit is what actually drives success in the world, and it's not merit. It's who you know and how mm -hmm. much they want to reward you. But it's also about the sort of jobs women do. Yes. Because predominantly women in Australia are working in casual, part-time, short-term, insecure work. And so if your employment doesn't have any permanency about it, if you don't have any security of employment, if you don't know how many hours you're going to work one week or whether you've got a job the next, then the notion of sort of climbing through the ranks and getting to a ceiling is just not part of your life mm. because you don't even have the first element of job security that allows you to think about a career path or a, or a climbing through something to hit a ceiling. So I just think for a lot of women in Australia, uh, leaving aside where we are globally, uh, the type of work we do in itself structurally creates a problem about your capacity to um, get into more senior positions or representative positions or leadership positions and earn more money. It was Equal Pay Day the other day. I think that it's got worse. It's 17.8% now, the difference, um, and that's gone backwards. So, and that is partly about the structural shifts in the labour market, mm -hmm. which, again, we've seen a huge increase in that casual insecure work, and that's women workers. Also, I know there's been quite a few interesting articles recently. Um, I think it was triggered by a woman who... Was she an advisor to Clint, Hillary Clinton? Who ended up having... To, yeah. A senior advisor yeah. who ended up quitting because she couldn't manage um, yes. family and work. And she, was, and she wrote quite extensively on, the, on this issue that it wasn't that she couldn't handle family and work. She was very well paid, incredibly tr privileged. It was that there was a culture of work in that particular environment, political environment, that um, she should be working 14 hours a day, um, 15 hours a day. The kind of And those kind of fairly extreme work environments put women... It do put women in an impossible situation, like it happens in the medical world as well. So surgeons um, are expected to kind of, the kind of working hours are extre can be extremely difficult to manage. So I do think that structural change can allow women of very high merit yeah. and very high level to kind of, because, it, you know, I do, I do suppose I believe that structure makes a different difference. We've got a couple of other questions, so I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> Hi, um, thanks very much for your wisdom and insight tonight. My name's Marianne, and I saw um, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner speak recently, and she was talking about um, 
a program that she'd um, championed, or a group of, of um, male leaders, the male champions for change. Um, and uh, it was established 22 um, Australian influential um, and diverse male CEOs, they're described as, to use their influence um, to ensure uh, women are represented in leadership and elevated on the national business agenda. And I, I, I suppose I had a few concerns about the, the, the profile of male leaders um, for change in that, in that space around gender and leadership, and I wondered your thoughts. I do think that if there are a lot, if the majority of um, CEOs or corporations are men, you absolutely need to get men engaged in, in this issue. So while I take your point that can end up kind of offering a kind of certain spotlight, um, I don't actually see how you could affect change without um, men working in these organisations taking these issues really and women seriously. Have always, you know, from the basic level, women could not have gotten the vote without men who were prepared to support them because they, that only men were parliamentarians who could introduce the bill, give women the vote. So women have always relied on the support of um, progressive, like-minded, sympathetic men mm. who equally want to change the world and who, importantly, um, are not as threatened by women's power as other men. I mean, I think it really comes down to that a lot of the time, whether you're talking about parliament or whether you're talking about a factory floor. You're talking about sharing, sharing space, you're sh sharing power. And, and certain men are prepared to do that and others are in, enormously threatened by it and will kick back in any way they possibly can, um, usually by saying that it's the women's fault in the first place in some kind of way. So I think that women have to work with men and, um, and I think it's really important to cultivate men's, um, you know, certain men's and particularly powerful men's um, mm. support and, and to co-opt them and to put pressure on them in order to do what in the end of the day is the right thing to do and most men know what in the end is the right thing to do. It also positions it as being a problem that men can be part of the solution yes. rather than, uh, you know, yet another thing that women have to drive because it's separate somehow to men and separate to men's experience of the world around them. That if men are part of the solution, then you can't perpetuate that idea that we'll tolerate women's agitation for equality as long as it doesn't affect us in any way. Yeah. yeah. My personal experience was it was a man of my father's generation who, when I was first a, a full-time unionist, who really just sort of opened up enormous numbers of doors and and sort of threw me in the deep end and said, of course you can do it. So I suppose just from a very personal level, the fact that, you know, he was a very traditional man of his generation in the blue collar union movement and that he was able to sort of cut through what was the prevailing view of a lot of other men about the role of women in unions was hugely important. So I, I think it's really important that the good guys get active. And also I think you can't always assume that, um, say, if, um, women CEOs are always going to be on side either. I mean, it cuts, it cut, cuts yeah. both ways. I think you kind Absolutely. of have to... Um, yeah, it would, I'd be very interested to see, though, what happens and, and kind yeah. of get some sense of what, of what these men actually do. Then I'd probably have a clearer sense of how to, how to respond to your question. So I was just curious, um, your opinion on with the past election you touched on, uh, the labour loss. Um, do you think if Julia wasn't ousted, um, would it have been much worse for Labor, because as Tony made gaffe after gaffe, I just kept wanting to see this sliding doors mm -hmm. version of the campaign, and I just thought, surely that would have galvanised women and perhaps things wouldn't have been so bad for Labor. I wonder what your opinion is. Oh, my opinion is that it absolutely would, would have been much worse for Labor with, if they hadn't uh, gotten rid of her. So I think Labor's choice was whether to um, salvage some uh, electoral dignity or to galvanise themselves around a principle that was sticking with the leader who they really knew had the most merit. And, um, and I think it was you know, a terribly, terribly difficult um, decision that I wouldn't have wanted to be one of the people having to put my hand up in the, in the caucus room. I'm not sure that I, I think I disagree. 
I don't necessarily think it would have been better, I don't, I, I, but I, I think that, um, that the only time it would have made a re serious difference would have been in those first few weeks. If Rudd had, um, managed, had called the election immediately and when he was on, hadn't kind of started to fray at the seams, I do think it could have made a big difference. But I actually think he left mm. the problem, the crack started to show because of the decision to kind of delay the election. And I think that Gillard would have ra rallied some of her kind of support mm. in the way that you suggest. I don't think it would have been great. But, I don't think but, you can divorce... Sorry, no, no. I don't think you can divorce the individual from the party. So you've got to look at what happened at the election before. Yeah, so if, if Julia had been the leader, but you still had the destabilising effect of Kevin Rudd and the disunity, then no, I don't think she could have done better. But if you could imagine that they actually had a, a unified party that were behind her and supporting her skills and Maybe. capabilities, yes. then that's a whole different story. So you can't, it's not just about the individual. You have to place the individual in what else was going on in that party. And so I don't, I, you know, this is going to be a debate forever, isn't it? Um, I don't necessarily agree that it would have been much worse. Um, I think that it, um, it, it could well have been similar, but there's a lot of ifs and there's a lot of things about how the party would have behaved and, and given its huge split um, and lack of capacity for a sort of unified um, response behind a leader, you know, it was always going to be tough, wasn't it? I do. I certainly don't agree, that, though, to your comments, Claire, that, that when Anne Summers was saying that the women in the cabinet should have resigned. I certainly don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I agree that they had mm -hmm. to make whatever decision they felt mm -hmm. they needed to make and that you would have actually been left in a worse situation. So I certainly didn't think that um, it should have been... that, that Wong or Plebisek should have been characterised mm -hmm. as traitors to some kind mm -hmm. of... Feminist sisterhood. I didn't no. think that yeah, was an appropriate response. All. I think that um, you know I've got an enormous amount of respect for Anne Summers, but I I disagreed with that as well. I don't mm. think that the solution to getting rid of one woman is getting rid of all of them. All falling on this. And I also think that it's. Uh, I know that this isn't what anyone has been saying tonight, but I think we have to be really mindful and careful of how we talk about the possibilities of what might have happened had Julia Gillard remained in the lead leadership because it's so easy to cross over or to, to reinforce to those people who might think that it had something to do with her being the leader and not to do with the culture of the that surrounded her yeah. and the culture yeah. of, not just of the party, but the culture of the response to being given permission to attack a woman in power. And, and maybe it's not quite as simplistic as that, but I think that... Um, it's, it's really difficult for people who aren't used to questioning their motivations for things to recognise that, the, that there is a difference between the way that they might have spoken about Julia Gillard and the way that they might speak about a male politician who they dislike. Because a, a lot of what I heard from people was, you know, well, it shouldn't be sexist just to say that you don't like the Prime Minister because she's a woman. And I think that a lot of people manage to equate somehow in their head that being critical of... Julia Gillard as a leader, or sorry, being critical of a man as a leader was the same as being critical of Julia Gillard as a leader and calling her a bitch and a witch and Larry Pickering drawing cartoons of her naked yeah. with a strap on dildo preparing to fuck the president, uh, the head of the RBA. You know, that, that you know there's a sexualised kind of nature, explicitly yeah. gendered mm. nature to the kind of abuse. And mm. I think yeah. Anne Summers has... Um, the Misogynist Factor is a good book for people mm. to read if they haven't acquainted themselves with those mm. details. Can I'm I just, just sorry? Can I clarify one thing there? Because oh, um, I'm not saying that the Labor Party should have gotten rid of her. I'm saying that I do agree that it would have been much worse um, electorally but I actually personally would have liked to have seen them rally around her mm. and say, well, we're going to go down, but we're going to go down swinging because, because we believe in her and we believe in what she's done, we believe in her program, but I also, we believe in, in what she's done over the last three years. We think that she's a fantastic leader. Which she was. Which she was. And, well, and Tony, she clearly was. Certainly, her, say, Tony her. Windsor's speech was very, very clear about that, about yeah. kind of... Um, I would have, yeah. Ideally, I would have loved to have seen the whole party rally around her like that, but I think that 
with Rudd still there and the, and the fact that she had, had, had um, taken the position that she had in the, in the way that it happened in the first place. I think a lot of things stemmed from that. And I think that it was unrealistic that they were probably going to do anything else. Mm. But that's not what I would have liked to have seen happen. I just want we've, to clear that up. <laughs> we've actually... No, I didn't actually think Gender. you were saying that was what you wanted. But um, we have actually come, come to the end tonight. And I would, there are several people I want to thank. I obviously want to thank Claire Wright, Claire, Clem Ford, Michelle O'Neill. I want to thank Leslie Canold, our tweeter. And I'd like to thank Jeff Taylor, who um, organised, did a lot of the organisational work tonight, who, who um, runs Melbourne Conversations. Yeah. Claps all around. Thank you. <laughs>